Bethany Ray, and this is the Priv Talks Podcast. Join me and my team as we pull back the curtain on work, life, family, friendship, leadership, entrepreneurship, and everything in between. We hope these conversations will inspire you, make you feel connected, and bring you a laugh. Welcome back. Hi, guys. Hi. Guys. Hi. Okay, today we are hosting an emotional eating, digestive, and hormone expert. She has overcame her own emotional eating with gaining and losing more than a thousand pounds, and her podcast, the No Sugar Coating Podcast, has over half half a million downloads. We welcome Amber Romat Romaniac. I but just butchered that, didn't I? Amber? You got it. That's exactly how to pronounce it, actually. Woo! Wow. <laughs> Thank you for I having me, like- ladies. You're welcome. I'm so actually excited to talk about everything you're all about. I cruise all over your website. We just recorded your podcast this morning as well on a totally other topic, but I feel like this is such a relevant topic every day and even more so right now with everything we're struggling with. Yeah, it's definitely something that a lot of people, especially women, struggle with regularly, but that I think this whole experience is um, like magnifying for some people. So I'm super, super excited to share today with you guys, and hopefully it will just bring some people some tips and relief if they are struggling. Awesome. Why don't we roll quickly through our boss or bus and current obsession so we can get straight to it because I feel like we have so much to talk about on this podcast. Yeah. Okay. Well, my boss or bust, I'm taking a boss. Um, the uncertain times of the business where we haven't, I haven't really been able to go to the office. I have actually found a lot of time to podcast lately. And so I was so excited to do your podcast this morning, Amber. We recorded the No Sugar Coating podcast. We did an episode about life balance and um, the the work-life balance that a lot of moms who are entrepreneurs or have jobs um, might struggle with. And then I also was a guest on The Blonde Files about a week ago. It hasn't aired yet and it will uh, be coming out. So we'll keep you guys tuned on all of those. Um, Talking about kind of the same thing, um, but in a different light. So I'm, I'm excited to share my stories and to kind of get the word about Priv Talks out there. And I just felt like a bit of a boss. What about you guys? Katie, you next? Um, I'm going to take a boss. So <clears throat> my fiance has decided to cut out some booze and, pardon me, <clears throat> and some carbs out of his diet, trying to lose a couple pounds. And I am not, but I have been living my life more in moderation lately, which is a struggle for me. As Donnie would know, I'm kind of an all or nothing type of girl. Um, so I made this like delicious uh, pasta that Donnie got, uh, got for me from the Italian cafe downtown. I made it with uh, the pasta and then a side with just like fried up chicken with a little bit of the sauce and then a big salad and garlic bread. And when he restricted himself to just the chicken and the salad, I still had salad, chicken, a little bit of pasta, no garlic bread and a glass of red wine. And I feel happy about it today. And I'm glad that I've got to the point where I'm okay with that. That's awesome. Moderation. Um, my boss, which was about to be a bus 10 minutes ago, is that for about a year, I haven't been able to figure out how to use the Nespresso machine. And I always go to it and then look at Katie, like, please help me. And today she was like teaching me to fish. She didn't even get up. And I was like, oh, you're not being a very good wife right now. So I figured it out and I made myself a coffee. I mean, it's not, it's the little things in life and I'm super proud of myself. (laughs) Kind of like the sink or swim when you teach your kid how to swim and you You, just throw them in. You threw me in the deep end for (laughs) sure. And you just watched me drowning, but I figured it out. Wow, Karen, I'm so proud of you. Thank you. (laughs) Amber, what is your boss or bust for the week? This is so funny, the timing of this. So I have a bust. Um, Every Sunday we do food prep and we make like the majority of our lunches and dinners and like I do some baking and some other stuff and I never ever burn anything and I make this homemade granola every couple of weeks and so this Sunday was the Sunday to make it and I put it in the oven and like did the usual time to bake it and then 
I like pulled it out to mix it one more time to put it back in for a couple of minutes and forgot to put the actual like amount of time on to then beep and it didn't and then I came back about 10 minutes later opened the oven the waft of burnt granola smell came out and I was just like ah this sucks because a it smells now now I'm gonna have to shower again because my I have burnt granola hair and B, now we don't have granola for the week, so we're just going to have to sub the oatmeal cookies that I made and crumble it up as granola. So yeah, I never burn anything, and this was a burn bust. (laughs) Crumbled oatmeal cookies sounds like a very good substitute, though. I know, honestly. It actually actually turned out. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. I was like one second away from burning all the garlic toast last night, but that's common for me, so that's very common. (laughs) Um, sorry, I was just writing something down and thinking about that cookie. <laughs> I'm too I have the recipe on my website for both if anyone ever wants to get into some baking. <laughs> well, I've been baking up a storm lately. Have you been doing the same through this quarantine? Yeah, you know what? What I've been doing is um, usually every Sunday I'll bake something, whether it's like a muffin, a loaf, a cookie. Um, I have a homemade flatbread recipe that I make. And so it's kind of like we pick something and we'll have some of it and then just freeze the rest so we can just accumulate in our freezer right now if we do end up, you know, having to kind of like not really go anywhere even to get groceries. So that's kind of what I've been doing. Um, But I love baking. Honestly, sometimes I just want to bake to make the house smell really good. Um, which is that's really... when I light a candle. <laughs> that's another good alternative. But the irony of it is, is now ten years after overcoming my food addiction, like I can bake and it, it can sit on the counter, and like my boyfriend will eat a lot more of it than I will. But I could not have ten years ago had a loaf sitting on the counter right now. Like I would just have eaten the whole thing. So it's nice to be in a space now where I'm so unattached from it, and I can have it if I want it. But I'm not like sitting on the couch battling with my mind, the back and forth of don't eat it, no go and eat it, don't eat it, no go and eat it. So it's nice to be in that space. Okay. I want you to hold that thought because I really want to dive into how to unattach from your emotional eating. Um, That was my first topic, Um, but let's quickly go through our current obsessions and then we will get into you and, and who you are and your message and why it's so important right now. Um, Katie, what is your current obsession? My current obsession lately, since we've been under this uh, quarantine, has been getting outside and running again. I feel like I've been doing very well going to the gym this winter. I've got a personal trainer to kind of keep me on track because I struggle with that. But now that the sun's coming out and it's so nice, I find it so easy to go outside and go for a jog. And I'm absolutely loving it. So hopefully the rain stays away for a little while. Um, Karen, what about you? Seven days. Um, my <laughs> current obsession is the app called House Party. And yes. this wasn't my current. I was like, no, this hasn't been mine before. Mainly because it's really fun for me to be able to connect with um, friends, but more so for my daughter, who's nine, who has all of her friends on it. Now she's not asking me every five minutes if I can watch her tumble or dance or routine or why can't she have her friends over? And now she's just like on house party with six or seven of her friends, including Katie's daughter, all day. And I love it. And every once in a while, we just pop our heads in because you can just join without asking. And they're like, get out of here, moms. Yeah. We like join and I'm like, what are you guys talking about? That's too mm-hmm. good. How many people are on their chat? Uh, sometimes like eight or like, yeah, usually it's for sure Kiana, her friend Kyoko, Riley's on there, and usually Lamaya. So there's usually like, I don't know, maybe there's a solid six of them that are generally on this chat together. That's amazing. That's so good because yeah. they're still getting their social experiences. Yeah. That's been something I've been struggling with is like not letting the kids have like play dates with anybody outside of someone. Like I've had let Riley come over a few times because she's family well, and she's I know great- she's quarantining. And she's a great and she's babysitter. A babysitter. <laughs> but I, I feel a little bit bad that they're not like out socializing and that's really important. Yeah. And you know what's really cool is Kiana is able to add on like her cousins. One lives in Tacoma and one lives in Florida. So we don't see them very often, obviously. But she's on there talking with them every day more than they would have before this all happened. So I think everyone should download it. 
Okay, well, I feel a little bit worse about my current obsession because this is definitely kind of one of the first like pregnancy cravings other than the ketchup chips that I've given into. Um, my neighbor went around and dropped off treats of pizzas of all things, which I haven't had a treats of pizza. I don't know if you guys remember what they are <laughs> from Dairy Queen. I don't even eat How dairy. How could one ever forget? I didn't well, know what they were. that's what remember? I thought. Um, anyways, it's like an ice cream cake on a, in the form of a pizza, but it's like a cookie crust with like soft serve ice cream and like drizzled chocolate and Smarties on top. And then she dropped off two, um, just in like the community, the heart of the community to like, you know, do something kind for somebody else. She dropped off these for everybody on our street, like at the end of our like entryway. And so I have been indulging in that for the last two nights and feeling ultra guilty about it, but also loving it. So that's my current obsession for the day. That's awesome. <laughs> Amber. I've never had a treat to pizza. Uh, you All about like, balance. Like, what, pal- what planet have you been living on, Karen? I'm allergic <laughs> to peanuts. And so I would like, don't go to Dairy Queen. Because they literally okay. like throw them up in the air and sprinkle them. But everywhere. yet you still hang out with me and I do the same thing. You eat peanuts all the time. <laughs> um, What's your Amber. current obsession, Amber? Um, we've been watching The Office, which has actually been so like refreshing during this time to complete our day, connect, and then just sit down and laugh. Um. We are in season three now, I think, and it's – if you like dry humor, it's really, really good. So I don't know if you ladies have seen it, but um, we're like – we get so pumped for our evening office time. And if it's not the office, it's Bob Proctor. So it's it's either laughing or mindset work, which is I, just perfect for right now, I think. I could watch The Office from the very beginning again, and I've seen every episode. I've never watched it, but I feel like because of how much I love Shit's Creek that I should watch it. No, Karen, it's right up your alley. Like for your sense of humor, you would really like The Office. I think I'm going to do that tonight. And I'm super obsessed with like the Jim Pam. Like they're like, they're like yeah. not in relationship, but they love each other so much. And I'm like, oh my God, when are you guys just going to date already? Like it's, it just makes me like excited inside to see, see that in well, the show. So. <laughs> it's kind of ironic too, because no one can actually be in an office right now. So yeah, that's true. <laughs> and, yeah. My, and maybe they'll never go back. So like maybe the yeah. office is just a very nostalgic thing that will be just get more and more epic. It'll Could be like be- the payphone where my daughter's like, what is that? <laughs> be like, oh, honey, that is the place where everyone used to go work together. She'd be like, that's weird. <laughs> go work together? A payphone? No, like an office. Oh, yeah. yeah. But like if we had payphones now, it'd be like a dollar a call. I had to use one at the airport when we got back from Dallas because my phone was dead. Shocker. <sighs> Shocker. And uh, I couldn't get a hold of Ryan. I didn't know where he was. And there was no courtesy phone. And I didn't want to use anyone's random phone. So I found a payphone. And Kiana was like, so excited she was like how does this work it was 50 cents <laughs> inflation's a hell of a thing yeah oh man that is the truth holy smokes but it's like I often wonder I'm like how much of this shift from like working from home is actually going to stick because I think there's yeah. a lot of companies scrambling right now to allow their employees to work from home and they're trying to get their servers going so they're sending them home with laptops so they can do like phone call work but like my father-in-law, for example, he he works for a big concrete company, but he does the phones. So like technically he should be able to, if he could access the server, do that remotely from wherever he is. Um, but the systems aren't set up that way. And those are really complex systems. But once they're in place, truthfully, like will people go back? Will there be a collapse in commercial real estate? I don't know. These are the things I think about at three in the morning. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> I was just going to ask, was it three in the morning when you were thinking about this? <laughs> it was. Yeah, it was actually. I did talk with a company last week and they were saying that one of the things that they're going to do is be going to more contract work rather than having the employees and all the benefits and the blah, 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 and downsizing the office. And that that's just in a week or two of this going on. And they were like already pivoting. So I think... 
I think we're going to see a big difference in the way that people work. Oh, terrifying and a little exciting. Let's, mm -hmm. let's see what plays out. Okay, let's talk about you, Amber, because I feel like we are going to have so much to talk about. So you just mentioned something that I want to get into, you, how you unattached from your emotional eating. How does one do that? That is a very big question to answer, but a, a great question. I think that the first step is to be aware that you are an emotional eater. Um, and I had no idea that I was an emotional eater for the first like 20 years of my life. I just thought that food was something you ate and you could eat what you whatever you wanted whenever you wanted um, and that it didn't really – I didn't put two and two together, the, the impact it could have on my physical, emotional, and spiritual health. Um, so I think the first step is to be aware that you are an emotional eater and to also not be ashamed or embarrassed if you are and that there's many levels of emotional eating. So to me, emotional eating is eating for any reason other than for physical nourishment. So physical nourishment is you're actually physically hungry. You need to nourish your body. You need to eat to fuel your body, give yourself energy, blood, you know, balance your blood sugar and fulfill your hunger. Any other kind of eating, whether it's for boredom, you're happy, you're sad, you're watching TV, you're multitasking and eating, you finished a meal, but you want to keep eating because you're not satisfied. You know, you're eating because you're stressed out about what, what's going on right now. You're eating because you just failed on your diet. You're eating because you restricted. Like there's so many potential triggers for emotional eating. Um, and I find a lot of the women I work with have common ones and then each have their own unique ones. So awareness is the first step. And I always encourage people to kind of start asking themselves before they reach for food, am I physically hungry or is this emotional hunger? Because starting to ask that question is another powerful step because 98% of the time, um, you know, especially the women that I work with or talk to are saying, wow, it's emotional hunger. It's often not physical. And that's pretty – that's a pretty big ratio, like 98% of the time people are eating when they don't even need to. So that's kind of the first step for me in disconnecting from emotional eating is understanding that you are dealing with it. And I think the other step of it is understanding, you know, where did it come from? Because I think for a lot of people, they've experienced some kind of a trauma or they had to move across the country or maybe the, what's happening right now is creating the emotional eating for them. I know for me, what really you know, defined um, or pushed me deep into my binge eating, which is just like completely losing control and eating as much as you can before you're so full that you feel sick is I, from a very young age, felt very self-conscious. I got called ugly and fat on the bus when I was five. And that was really a defining moment for me. And I took on that identity. I dyed it all through my teens. And then when I went through a bad breakup, I wanted to look perfect lost weight really fast, got the perfect body, wasn't happy, and then a switch flipped, and then I binged uncontrollably and gained a lot of weight. And so for me, you know, low self-worth, not feeling good enough, revolving my world around what I thought I had to have was that perfect body, be the perfect weight to be happy, that fueled all of this unhealthy behavior with food in my body. And so I think also understanding, you don't have to know every detail, but just understanding like, is there anything that for me feels like it's fueling this behavior? fueling me to want to go to food and use food as a crutch or a coping tool. Um, so that's what I always encourage people to kind of start exploring at first regarding the emotional relationship with food, because it does take time to shift. Like it's not, I wish I just had like a magic answer, but there's no quick fix to resolve it. There's no pill you can take. There's no like one thing you can do that's just going to end it tomorrow. Um, it takes time to gain freedom from it, but it's possible to. But the beautiful thing of it is when people are ready to deal with their emotional eating and overcome it, they give themselves the opportunity to build a healthy relationship with themselves, with food, you know, learn how to love themselves. They create worthiness and acceptance and feelings of enough. And the growth and shifting that comes from that for people is priceless and it's life-changing. What are some tips and tricks that you could suggest? Because this is such a big topic. Like, where do you even start? 
Yeah. So I think the first step is, is asking yourself the question before you eat, like, am I physically or emotionally hungry? And really what the differences are between the two of those is physical hunger cues look like you get a hunger signal. You can actually physically tell that you're hungry. Um, your stomach is rumbling, your energy all of a sudden drops, your, your blood sugar drops, and you kind of get that hangry, hungry, angry feeling, you know, um, those are some physical cues, or maybe you look at the clock and realize you haven't eaten in two or three hours. So to me, those are quite obvious signs that you probably need to physically fill up your body. Um, And then if you physically fill up your body and you're going, well, I still want to eat, I still want to go and eat those chips or the chocolate or whatever it is, you know, then I think it's important to explore, okay, well, what may be going on emotionally for me right now? Am I stressed? Am I bored? Am I really struggling with all the change happening right now? Do I, um, when I feel uncomfortable, is that my go-to is to eat? Or perhaps it's that you're dehydrated and you're not drinking enough water. You're tired. You may have hormone imbalances. You may have digestive issues fueling this, or it may be, again, self-worth. So as I'm sharing this, like, while again, I wish I just had like quick tips, um, which I will um, get more into, I want to also have people understand that there is a depth to emotional eating and to these cycles and that understanding all of the different reasons why you are emotionally eating is so empowering. So even if it's like, well, you know what? I notice I don't drink my eight glasses of water a day or my two liters of water a day. Like that can be a very positive thing to focus on. Um, you know, if you're finding, oh, well, I'm stressed, I'm really overwhelmed with everything going on. Like maybe you want to set healthy boundaries with technology. Maybe you want to try to get to bed a bit earlier or just disconnect from technology completely between like a certain, you know, block of time and, and put that time into self-care, whether it's a new hobby or you're coloring, you're reading, you're taking a bath, you're having a dance party, you're meditating, you're deep breathing, um, you're doing a facial or, you know, you're having a mini spa hour. I just think that um, this is a great time to recognize, you know, that you're, you have this emotional hunger and that you can actually go to other non-food related, um, tools and activities to help you cope and start to undo the pattern. Because if people have been doing this for a while and it's a pattern, it's also going to take time to undo this old pattern and create a new one. But having healthy ways to cope, like some of the things I've just suggested, or if you have other things that you do, like mindful movements, you know, there's just so many things we can do to help break the old pattern and go to a new one. Um, We also, you know, something we talked about was food prep. And I think having your food prepared also sets you up for success um, because then you're far more likely to go and reach for that nourishing meal or snack. And that helps to keep your blood sugar more balanced and that helps to keep cravings at bay. And that has you feeling far less likely to get really hungry. And then when you get really hungry, you can get like dizzy and lightheaded and start to feel off. And that can really kind of scare people and make them go, oh my gosh, I've got to just eat the first thing that I see, which can just set us up for um, maybe not as an ideal of a choice. And then I know when a lot of people do that, they get into judgment or they feel guilty and then they go, well, screw it. I've just messed up the day. So I might as well just eat like crap for the rest of the day when we don't have to do that. So if you do end up having something that maybe you weren't planning to reset in that moment, breathe, have some water. You can still eat well for the rest of the day. So so those are some tips and suggestions that people can kind of start to explore. But I really encourage people to spend time getting to know their triggers and building awareness if this is something that they are struggling with. Can I ask you a question, Amber? It's Karen. Yeah. Um, So my background, I actually had an eating disorder for a long time. I was anorexic. And then when I was, after I was hospitalized at 87 pounds, and then I was bulimic to get out of the hospital and do all the right things. That was this was a long time ago in my early twenties. Um, but on the other, on the flip scale of binge eating, I think it's the. It, do you find it's the same emotions that make us stop eating that make us eat more? Do you do you know what I'm saying? Because for um, me, when I'm busy, yeah. like I'm, I'm looking on your Instagram right now, it says overbooked schedules fueling binge eating, and um, I'm sure a lot of people right now are. Cra- their life is crazy. They have kids at home. They're working. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess what about for the women who like me who just like won't eat for nine hours? And it's not. I'm not trying to hurt my body, but when I get overwhelmed or overworked, that's my. That's what I do. Yeah. So what's so fascinating is for a lot of people, they get stressed or overwhelmed and they will eat. And then there are some people who, when they're in heightened stress, they will not eat. Um, and actually. It's our body's primal response when we're in stress to go out of rest and digest mode and into fight or flight. So we're producing adrenaline, which is our stress hormone. We're producing that cortisol. 
And when we're in fight or flight mode, our bodies think there is a threat going on. So our bodies are focusing on protecting you. And therefore, I um, ideally what's supposed to happen is our hunger is supposed to shut down so that your body can prepare, you know, and get all your circulation out of your digestive region into your limbs so you can run away from the quote unquote bear that is obviously not there, but that the body again is, we're programmed from these, you know, primal caveman days. So when you're not feeling hungry, if you're, you know, really busy or you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed out, um, a very powerful way to get out of that fight or flight and get back into rest and digest mode is to do some kind of self-care to calm the nervous system down so that you can get the circulation back into your core. You'll be able to digest properly. Your hunger cues will come back. Um, So yeah, it's very common for some people to not be hungry. The only breakdown then with that is, you know, if we're, you know, skipping food for most of the day, that can have a significant impact on our hunger hormones, our metabolism, our um, cortisol and thyroid and our, our hormones. And it can, um, in the long term, actually shut down our hunger, hunger signal, and it can be more difficult for us to produce a hunger signal and really tell when we we are hungry and need to eat. Um, I'm so very. Can, go ahead. Go, you go first, Karen, and then I'll go. No, off I was just gonna. No, I was just gonna ask another question. So if you're gonna go off on that, go ahead. No, no, you go. I, I wrote, okay. wrote my question. Down I just saw. I'm just. I'm on your Instagram, so I'm just like noticing you have all these like great little. Um, like bite-sized pieces of information that I feel like even as I'm scrolling through, I'm like, yep, yep. I know people that deal with that, but it says fear of eating healthy carbs. So everybody is talking about keto and everyone's talking about paleo and all these diets. And um, I don't want to make you go down the rabbit hole of that, but when people, I like in here, it says people are even scared to eat a carrot now. So what do you Mm -hmm. find when it comes to healthy carbs? How important are they? And what's like a healthy balance that someone could try to have in their life? Yeah, so I'm seeing this epidemic of from the keto diet and all these low carb diets. This it's fueling perfectionism with eating, and perfectionism doesn't exist. And so then it's fueling binge eating, and people are binging on, you know, healthy carbs like fruits and vegetables, or they're binging on sugar because you know you you have to restrict. So my goal is that we need to get away from restrictive diets because they're not realistic to keep unless you have a serious health condition and you're being monitored by doctors and and that's something you need temporarily. I don't think the majority of the population, especially who has an emotional relationship with food and is doing it because they're panicking about their weight, that it's a good path to take because it's creating these food fears. Um, we need healthy carbs. So our muscles need carbohydrates. Our heart is a muscle. We, Our heart needs that food and that fuel. Um, something that's so interesting that I see with a lot of the women who come to work with me is if they've done a low-carb diet or they've done keto, it's actually um, caused more harm than good. Their hormones are more out of whack. Their digestion is more out of balance. They're more exhausted. Um, so carbohydrates are an energy source. Things like our fruits and vegetables, you know, brown rice, quinoa, buckwheat, millet, um, whole grains, like things that are wholesome that we can break down and utilize. To me, they are so good for us. The key always with carbs, I say, is they break down more quickly than our proteins and fats. So if you are having a meal and you're having, you know, say like roasted sweet potato, um, and maybe you're having like a side of salad and then you have, you know, always make sure you add a protein and a fat because the protein and the fat is going to help to, you know, break down the carbs more slowly. So one of my ideal snacks for people is like a piece of fruit, like an apple with nut butter or nuts, because the fat is going to break down the sugars in the fruit more slowly. And it's going to last a lot longer than if you just eat the piece of fruit. So I used to have really bad adrenal fatigue and I would eat like animal protein for breakfast. And then I realized that that was actually keeping my adrenal fatigue or my high cortisol high because it takes more energy to break down, um, you know, high protein in the morning. So um, as an example, when I started to add in more carbs with my breakfast, like I started to have oatmeal and fruit and throw like some fat in there and have collagen in my um, tea, which is a good protein source my cortisol started to regulate more easily because I had more energy to heal my hormones um, and I didn't have to expend as much energy to break down the protein. So I think it's so important that we incorporate things like starchy vegetables, um, any kind of vegetable for that matter, um, our fruits, like I'm not afraid of fruit. Um, and and these if, if you tolerate these grains, like add them in, um, of course, be mindful of food sensitivities, but I do think they're really important for balance. Um, and how realistic is it? for a lot of people to 
I'm, I mean, up until now we're social distancing, but like if you're traveling or there's celebrations and parties and social gatherings, it can be very difficult to upkeep a more restrictive diet. So I do think we need healthy carbs. They help balance our hormones. They help with our sugars and our energy levels, mental clarity, so many things. Yeah, I, I relate told- to that. Oh, so- <laughs> no, go Katie. <laughs> go. We'll let you talk eventually, Donnie. Oh, we can <laughs> video on this. Um, I can relate to that so much. Personally, I've struggled with bulimia f- on and off for 10 years when I was younger. Um, binge eating was a huge thing for me. It was emotional eating 100%. And then when I felt like I got the bulimia under control, it was crash diets. That mm-hmm. was the next thing. So um, intermittent fasting or keto or whatever it was and everything HCG can't tell you how many times I did that one and put my uh, hormones into a full spin so Mm -hmm. I think what I've noticed mainly is that when I have a balanced diet and I'm eating my carbs and I'm actually eating higher fat healthy fats like avocados and nuts I can eat more and I, my body changes, I lose weight, I gain muscle. And mm-hmm. it's something that I can stick to for the rest of my life. And it's not something that's restricting me at all. It makes me happier. I get the results I want. And it keeps me in a safe zone mentally as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I love that you found that sweet spot for you. And I think that's just so important to share is there is not one diet or way of eating that is going to be your be all end all for the rest of your life. You may find aspects of like, like you said, like having your carbs and then like having more fat, like that seems to be a sweet spot for you. But as, as we change, as our stressors change, as our environment, our mindset changes, as our hormones change, like we may have to tweak what we're doing a little bit with our food, but that's where becoming in tune with our bodies and learning how to listen to our bodies. So this slowdown that is happening right now is a great opportunity for us to check in with our bodies and go, you know, I ate that meal with these different things. Like, how do I feel? Do I feel more energy? Do I feel less energy? Do I feel sluggish now? Um, Because everyone needs something a little bit different. So if we can hop off of this, like, you know, diet culture bandwagon, which is like, you need to eat less and exercise more to lose weight and, and be happy. Like that's such an archaic mentality and start to go more into, well, while there are, is all this information available and there's all these different kinds of foods to eat, like what may work best for me? And part of that really, I find, you know, depending on your current state of health, so like your hormones, your sleep, your stress, your gut health, and your relationship with food, like that can, you know, dictate maybe what you're having a little bit more of and a little bit less of, and then that will change, right? I have so, a question. Yeah. I have, sorry, I have a question for you. Um, have you ever dealt with younger children? Like my daughter is super fit and she's very active, but her eating I see some signs of like, not necessarily emotional eating, but unhealthy eating and not grasping it. Do you think there's an age where it's too young to like talk to them and give them information about it? Because like I struggled at a young, like around 14 with bulimia and I would just, I feel like I almost have a fear of my children following in my footsteps because it was totally secretive for me. Mm -hmm. My mom wondered what was going on. I was super active. I had a trainer. I played hockey, but yet I was kept putting on weight because I was closet eating in my bedroom at nighttime. I don't think it's too early to ever instill good habits and encourage your kids to, you know, compliment themselves and, you know, instill gratitude in them and have them like, you know, build a positive mindset for themselves because I I mean, you can never set your kids up for if they go out and like someone totally bullies them. And then if they choose to take that on, like I did, like I was five and I took on this whole identity of I'm fat and ugly because some older boys told me that I didn't know how to cope with it. I didn't know how to not believe it. So, you know, you can prepare your kids at the same token, if they're meant to have an experience, even if it is an experience of suffering, sometimes nothing we can do will um, necessarily like take them off that path. But I think get them in the kitchen, get into really healthy recipes, be mindful of how much refined food you bring into the house. Like I think if we can get them eating really good and get them into the ingredients and the recipes and, and, and get them like with their hands in it, it instills better eating habits and then like instilling the positive self-talk. And of course, 
parents being mindful ideally of what they're saying about themselves around their kids and and how they're behaving around food around their kids because the kids pay attention to what the parents are doing like I've witnessed time and time again where I've had women say I don't want my kids to like hear me in this negative self-talk or see me doing what I'm doing so I'm, I'm being very mindful about how I am around them and I mean you guys can you know share your insights on that but I've also witnessed kids who have parents who are like big into sugar or like you know not really too aware of like what they're eating and the kids now are like not wanting to eat their dinner but then when they bring out the pudding or the treats they're like going all in with that so we can program kids from a very young age with certain habits um, and I think there's that the parents do have a lot of power, but at the end of the day, you could be like so good with them and they could still have an experience and still bring up these habits, I guess. What age were you when it was like your light bulb moment where you decided to make a change? I was 23. Um, so what was your aha moment? Yeah. So for me, um, I had really significantly been struggling with binge eating for about a year and a half where it would be like, I'd go to the store, buy a basket of food, spend like a hundred dollars, come home, put on a movie, eat until I was completely so full and bloated and so much pain. Um, and I had finished a binge and I was laying on the couch crying and I was really scared for my life because I was hurting my body. I was so bloated. My health kept declining. I was really heavy. I was eating all these foods that just I knew in in this large amount were not good for me. Um, And I was concerned about what that was going to do to my heart health, my body, you know, the longevity of my life. I mean, I just felt very alone because I had all these hopes and dreams and I was, you know, not dating. I wasn't being social. And when you're 23, like you should be having the time of your life. And here I was like crying on my couch, like in a, you know, ocean of wrappers. And I you know, had kind of laid there for about an hour. And then I had, you know, some of the food settled. And so I thought, oh, I could go for another cookie. I might as well do this one more time. And I dug through the garbage. I went into the kitchen, pulled out my little blue garbage can, and I dug through the garbage to eat. And that was really my low point because I just thought to myself, I just ate out of a garbage can. Like, who am I? I don't know who I am. This isn't me. I don't know why I'm doing this or how I'm going to change it, but like I can't keep hurting myself like this because I don't know if I'll make 30 if I keep binging this aggressively and keep gaining weight this quickly and just again all the the physical and emotional battle that I was in. And so that was really my aha moment you could say that really inspired me to think I'm really afraid of this or how I'm going to change it, but I can't stay this way. Mm -hmm. One point to that that I notice – Everyone, there's all the memes and people are joking about, oh, when I'm stuck at home, you know, I've gone through my quarantine supply and people are joking about junk food and gaining weight and it's become a laughable thing. But I notice in my life, like it's so much easier to stay on track when I am in a busy lifestyle. Maybe if you're making responsible decisions, you know, if you don't have too much time to to be at home, to be fixated on what you're eating, that's the hardest time to stay disciplined, I think. Um, What is your advice to somebody who would be struggling with that? Because now people are stuck at home and they don't even, you know, they've got all the time in the world. Mm -hmm. They don't have social distractions. They don't, um, for me personally, maybe it would be like throwing in a workout and then I feel kind of set off for the day. Mm -hmm. So I don't really don't want to go against that. But what would be your advice? Yeah. And thank you for bringing that up. Um, I think it's so important that we get into a very well-established routine at home right now that includes like your relaxation, mindful movement, getting outside into nature, um, you know, take up an online course that you've been, you know, putting to the side for a while. If you're still working from home, like get ready, put on your, your clothes and your, do your hair and, and your outfit. Um, incorporate self-care. So I think whether this is anything, again, from a hobby that you want to take on or get back into painting, coloring, drawing, you know, pick different themes for your day. Like, so is today kind of like your spa day theme. You're going to do a facial, you're going to do your nails, you're going to, you know, have a bath. Um, 
get into a good book series. Um, this is a great time to take up meditation of whatever you know kind you want, whether it's guided or you know listening to relaxing music and just being in a comfortable position with your eyes closed. Deep breathing, journaling. This is a great time to journal, whether it's like writing down ten things you're grateful for every day or writing about how you're feeling about everything. Um, this is also a great time to set up you know phone call dates with your friends, your family, people that you can't connect with in person right now and and to actually maybe block off certain parts of your day where it's like this is a self-care block this is a movement block this is a social connection block this is you know work block or like online course blocking um and then also having some quiet time though where you don't necessarily need to do anything um and also maybe a food prep block also i find it's a great time to um actually kind of integrate into that routine, just like your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Not that you have to eat at exactly those times every day, but to kind of just set it up as it would be if you were out in your work, um, which would be, okay, I'm having breakfast at this time. This is roughly when I want to have my lunch break. And then this is, you know, around when we're having our dinner. And the goal with that is, you know, having those times available, having some food prep done. So even if you have additional food at home to get you into a whole routine that's helping you take the focus off of the food, right? So you can have good food at home, you can do some baking, but also know your limits. So know if you are, you know, doing extra baking right now and then you're feeling extra tempted to go and eat more of it and then you're eating half of it and it's making you feel frustrated, you know, do you want to focus more on savory food right now because you just feel more vulnerable? Um, I think that's important as well. And you know, going to the memes and stuff like that, you know, I think it's so important that we try to be as light as possible with the emotional eating that may be happening right now and and to not feel ashamed or embarrassed or try as hard as you can to not judge yourself if if you do it. At the same token, and I mean this with love, but I don't think we should be joking about emotional eating or making fun of it or that it's it's okay to like, you know, binge or like overeat right now because in a sense like I really see it as a way of hurting the body we're suppressing our immune systems we are hurting our digestive systems um, it impacts our hormone health it produces inflammation and then the emotional after effects that we feel the guilt the anger the hopelessness the sadness it, it could maybe fuel the fear of panic for some people because now they have to go spend more money on more food like it's, it may seem fun or innocent in the moment, but I think it just can fuel everything that's going on. Um, and so I just, I don't think we should be going, oh yeah, it's totally fine that I just ate through whatever my stash of quarantine food, um, because it could create like a very serious habit in the long term. So I think, you know, having those food times and then having, you know, other things to focus on to help us from, you know, just sitting there and going, well, I don't know what else to do other than eat and watch TV. Well, there's so many other potential things we could do if we're open to it. And if you are struggling with it, I think there's a great opportunity to actually work on addressing it right now because you have more time. And that's one of the biggest, um, like blocks that I find the women that come to work with me have in the beginning is they go, I just don't have time to do this work. So maybe I'll come back in six months when I have more time or like, you know, once I'm, you know, able to take time off work or whatever. And I'm like, well, great. Now people have more time to do this work. So I really would encourage you to start, you know, working on your mindset and, and working on yourself because it will also help to limit the emotional eating that is potentially happening for people. Yeah, I agree with you so much. One of my biggest, um, my one of my biggest goals with the kids being out of school and being home is implementing a morning workout and getting them in the kitchen, getting them making their own healthy meals and really concentrating on that part of it alongside with the school. Mm -hmm. I also think there's it, it's dangerous to normalize it with some of the memes yes. because what might be binge eating for me is not on a, is on a completely different scale for somebody else where I'm like, oh my God, I had two pieces of treats of pizza to somebody else. That might be two treats of pizzas, a bag of chips. And you know what I mean? So it, yeah. it's, it's just, it, it, everybody is so different and we just need to be sensitive that there are, there are levels in, of tolerance or self-discipline are different. Oh, for sure. Um, I just, yeah, for me, I just don't like seeing like, oh, it's okay if you're emotionally eating right now. 
you know, it's just like if you are like talk to somebody about it or, you know, reach out for support or explore a podcast that maybe, you know, you can listen to because everyone, yeah, deals with it in a different way. For some people, emotional eating could be one piece of chocolate every day, but it's to understand that if you are going to food to cope with something else, there is a very, you know, powerful opportunity right now to go, what is this about? What is this really about? And can I spend some time sitting with that instead of just going to the food first? Or, you know, instead of going for a bunch of candy, like maybe can I try like a piece of fruit instead? Like, you know, is there a way to kind of meet yourself in the middle if for some reason the craving is just so intense and you try a couple other things first? Um, I don't think it's so easy to just stop. Like it's just not that easy to go cold turkey with it. Um, but having like things to meet yourself in the middle with can also be helpful. I have one quick question before we wrap it up because my husband has been doing like intermittent fasting, but like also actual fasting. And he has a good friend that does it for health reasons. He talks about like parasitic cleanses and like a reset on your immune system. And so my husband's done like a two 48 hour cleanses and a uh, fast, sorry. And I think he did a 72 hour as well, which as a pregnant woman is absolutely intolerable to witness. Um, but what are your thoughts on fasting? Like, do you think there's any healthy level of it or do you think it's dangerous? Um, I really believe if you have any kind of emotional relationship with food, it's dangerous and it can just fuel more emotional eating or more binge eating. Um, I think for a small amount of the population who has a healthy relationship with their body, with food, that it's not going to trigger anything negative emotionally, that it, it could be okay for. But at the same token, I think it's also important to understand your current state of health, your hormone health, especially before you do something like that, because it, let's face it, it is a very extreme act. And while there can be benefits, um, I think we really need to know what's going on with our bodies and make sure that it would be a proper step. I don't suggest it for weight loss or, you know, a lot of people are doing it to try and lose weight fast and quick fix. And to me, that's where we have to deal with the body image and the mindset stuff. So, um, mostly no, if there's an emotional relationship with food and then maybe for some people who, um, just are in a space where they're whole and there's no underlying, like self-sabotaging reasons why they want to do it. Can I ask you a quick question if we have time? Before we wrap yep. it up, yeah, go um, ahead. just about hormone, I saw uh, you talk a lot about hormone imbalance and I feel like this could be a whole other podcast in itself, but for me, I'm 39, I've had two kids, obviously I've had an eating disorder and then had some other health challenges along the way. And so I know for me, my hormones are a little bit out of whack. Katie has had the same experience. Is there something, because the conversation amongst women my age is all the same. It doesn't matter what I do. I still have those 10 pounds that won't come off. They're always kind of in the same area. Then everyone starts with like the body image. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if you have any, like, is there resources that you have for women who are suffering with hormone imbalance where they could go to learn about what foods are best to eat or best practices or something like that? Yeah. So there's a couple answers to this question. Number one is if, you know, you find you're hanging on to weight. I really like to refer to weight as protection. So hormones can play a role in us hanging on to weight or not being able to lose it. But I think it's so important for us to explore why may my body be hanging on to this protection? Is it hormonal? Is it inflammation? Is it because I'm emotionally eating and then restricting? Is it high stress? Is it because I actually don't want to be seen and gain attention by losing the weight so I'm going to hang on to it? So understanding that weight again is a primal response um, gaining weight, you know, when our bodies don't feel safe physically, mentally, or emotionally. Um, from a hormonal standpoint, before we get into like specific recommendations or, you know, foods or supplements that women could take, it's actually so important to understand which hormones are out of balance and why. Because, you know, you can go online and be like, oh, yeah, you know, put maca powder into your smoothie. It's really good for adrenal fatigue. But if you have high estrogen, it will actually increase your estrogen levels potentially. And so you're helping one thing, but hurting another. It, another example would be like broccoli and cauliflower. So broccoli and cauliflower um, raw are really good for pulling excess estrogen out of the body, but broccoli and cauliflower raw can also inhibit thyroid function. So understanding the picture first is so important because otherwise you can end up 
correcting one thing, but potentially then throwing another thing off and not even realizing it. So um, I have, you know, different podcasts where I talk more in depth about different hormones and different ways that like we can start to address them. But then I always encourage people like, you know, if you really think you're struggling with this and this is something that's been going on for you for a long time and you've tried so many different things and nothing is working and you've maybe seen your doctor for like a bit of a workup, but they just keep saying everything is normal, like get another opinion. Like out of the, you know, seven or 800 women that I've worked with over the past seven years, I've only had one ever come back with no imbalances. Like that's significant. And I'm talking women from 25 to 75. So I think it's so important to like, you know, explore that avenue. Like I, that's, that is one thing I do with every person I work with because there's always something there. Um, and I think it's so important to investigate it and understand the full picture so that you can give the specific recommendations and not accidentally throw something else out of whack because then you have to go and keep hunting and figure out, well, okay, I'm still gaining weight or I still can't lose it. What's going on? Hormones are very complex and we have to just be mindful that we know the whole picture. Um, to start making recommendations. I was going to speak to that for one second. Um, I think, I think you also like, I don't personally, I have never gotten any of the proper advice from a doctor on this subject. Yeah. Um, the answer I always get from my family doctor is you're fine. Look at, you've had babies. Like your hormones are fine. Mm -hmm. Like they brush over anything. And then if I go see a naturopath or explore any kind of uh, alternative medicine, I get answers on my hormonal health. So I also feel like traditional medicine, you need to be a little bit wary of it that you might not get the best advice um, towards this topic. Yeah. And that's definitely experience that most of my clients have when they go to get, you know, the test done that I want them to get is they go, oh, you don't need that. Or why do you need that? Or who wants you to get that? And um, I know with all due respect to the doctor that, you know, these tests are something that, you know, cost some money and that here in Canada, like it's covered, but that it's, you know, it is an expense for the system. But um, I just think it's so important to like if your doctor can do it and you get it covered, great, then we can go over it and, you know, take the steps forward. And if not, like there's always a way to explore it and get support from someone else and always have your doctor there to back you up. Um, it definitely, I can't wait for the day, hopefully, where everyone just works a bit more together from Western and Eastern um, because I think it would just be such an unstoppable, powerful um, system if if and when that happens. But yeah, I think it's important to look outside of the normal realm of just going to your doctor for this stuff. Um, luckily, I've been able to um, help my clients get access to testing through um, another doctor and an ND and just, you know, other um, methods so that we can get that information because I just think it's a vital piece of the puzzle that has been ignored for too long for a lot of people that we can't keep ignoring because it's contributing to people's fatigue and brain fog and weight and energy and mood and cycles and so many things that um, I just think that we shouldn't accept these symptoms as our norm. Agreed. This has been so informative. Can you please tell our listeners where they can find you? Um, I'm sure everybody's going to be listening to your podcast. I will definitely be following up for more tips and tricks on all of these topics. They're so relatable for me. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad that you guys have found this relatable and all your questions are so good. It, it's just so easy to keep kind of going on it. Um, so people can find me on my website at amberapproved.ca. I do have a free emotional eating quiz and offer to connect for a 30 minute complimentary consultation. If you're wanting to have a conversation, talk about your health struggles and goals, you know, um, and maybe what's holding you back from moving forward. You can listen to the no sugar coating podcast on all podcast apps. And I'm on Instagram and it's my name, Amber. Romaniuk, R O M A N I U K. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right. We will talk to you soon. My laptop is about to die. So, this has been the perfect length of a podcast <laughs> to wrap it up. Thank you so okay, much. Bye, I appreciate it. Thank okay, you. Okay. Bye, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you love Priv Talks podcast, please rate and review. Then, DM us a screenshot of your review with your address to at Privtalks Podcast so we can send you a free gift. 
Also, we want to keep the conversation going, so please join us on Instagram and get into our private Facebook group where we can chat and stay connected. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye.